Good evening and welcome. I'm James Liu and I'm a librarian at the Stanford Health Library. Thank you for joining us. Our talk tonight is entitled, Say Goodbye to Heart Heartburn. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Randall Strafford. Dr. Strafford is a professor of medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine. He's also the director of the Program on Prevention Outcomes and Practices. His research emphasizes clinical issues and health behaviors related to chronic disease. Throughout the talk, please enter any questions in the Q&A box at the beginning of your screen, uh, at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the talk, Dr. Strafford will answer as many of those as possible. Dr. Strafford, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, James. It's uh, really nice to be here. And let me just bring my talk up here and I'll get started. So I'm going to be talking about the topic of GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, sometimes just known as reflux. And uh, this is an area that is part of the bread and butter of what I do as a clinician, that is to uh, treat primary care patients. And it's one of the topics, it's one of the conditions that I see every day that I'm in the clinic. So I thought I would approach this with kind of two things in mind. One is that I do want people to come away with some basic information about GERD and its treatments and some of the controversies there. But I also want to step back a little bit and kind of think about the whole model of care that's implied by how we are treating GERD now and really reconsider whether we should be treating GERD in a slightly different way in a way that really puts more emphasis on the patient and the patient's uh, behaviors and self-management. So let's get started. So my discussion tonight is gonna start out talking about what is GERD and uh, have a little illustration that I'll come back to something like this to uh, talk about that some more. But this is the GE or gastroesophageal junction. And uh, reflux is this process of acid from the stomach going upwards the wrong direction into the esophagus, which is right here. And uh, this causes some considerable symptoms justifying causing it, um, labeling it a disease. Um, I'm going to work on how it's diagnosed and talk about prevention and non-drug treatments of GERD. I think this is an underemphasized area. And then go over the various medications for GERD, and there are quite a number of them, many of them familiar to you because all three main classes of drugs are now available over the counter and can be purchased directly by consumers without a prescription. I'm gonna talk very briefly about surgical approaches. These are mostly used in extreme cases. Um, and then talk about some of the complications of GERD. Essentially answering the question, you know, besides symptoms, why are we so interested in treating GERD? And I think those are, those are very important area to talk about. So let's, step back a little bit. And I want to make a couple of points about what's going on as we think about GERD treatment overall. We really have had a renewed emphasis on non-drug treatments and patient self-management because of some new concerns about the overuse of potentially risky drugs. These issues have been there for a long time, but really some of the new analyses of the long-term risk of taking particularly a drug class called PPIs has reached a level where we're really rethinking our use of drugs and falling back on uh, sort of more traditional approaches, which are these non-drug and preventive approaches. The other thing is that I think we really should be taking a, a societal uh, perspective that tries to prevent GERD in the first place. There are some easy ways of doing this. Not all of them are going to be successful within our current milieu of how we eat and how we don't exercise and how we gain weight. But these prevention strategies can be a really good way of getting the population 
in tune with trying to prevent and, and successfully treating GERD when it does occur. Um, this is yet another reason to reconsider uh, lowering your alcohol intake. Um, I think as many may have heard me before, I really think as a society, we've been fed a mythology that alcohol had benefits when in fact it has no net benefits. And we are learning more and more about how even low dose alcohol can have harms. Um, I also wanna emphasize this connection between mental health issues and other diseases. This is ubiquitous across the range of conditions I treat in primary care, but this, this connection really goes kind of uh, taken for granted in many ways. And I think we do need to, to focus on this a bit more. And then finally, I'm gonna get back to something that probably was relatively controversial a decade ago, which is the use of mind-body therapies. And by this, I mean things like relaxation approaches, yoga, you know, even things like mindfulness and meditation um, are part of these body mind-body therapies. I think that they do have a definite role within the, uh, the prevention and treatment of GERD. So I want to just emphasize that GERD in some ways is just another example of how we may be mistreating chronic disease. And ideally, I really believe that we should be using this idea of a public health approach as our first line of prevention and treatment, focusing on an intensive health behavior approach when that doesn't work, and then only in some sense as a last resort, seeking drug therapies to get the job done. And uh, you know, more, more specifically, this general advice should be made to all consumers. In some sense, what I'm talking about here is strategies to prevent GERD in the first place. There may be some intensive health behavior approaches that should be added beyond this general advice. And again, this is true for GERD. And then, you know, drugs should be added um, as needed on top of those ongoing health behavior strategies. Unfortunately, the way that medicine is often practiced and practiced around the treatment of GERD, you know, often we start with just assuming that a drug therapy is going to do the trick. I think this places too much emphasis on drug therapies. It also places the patient at risk that they might not have to bear if one of these earlier approaches was successful. So I'm, I'm clearly not saying that we can substitute for drug therapies. Drug therapies may be very important, but we ought to try other things first and keep those other things going as we add drugs. And I'll make this a little more clear as we go through some of the example of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So let's talk a little bit more about GERD. You know, essentially, we're talking about irritation and inflammation of the lower esophagus. And the process, as I briefly mentioned, is reflux, or in a sense, regurgitation of stomach contents into the esophagus, kind of going the wrong way, and splashing up into the esophagus, including the hydrochloric acid that is part of the, the stomach um, and it's part of the contents excreted in the stomachs, the stomach there for the purpose of, of breaking down many types of food we eat, a particular protein. Um, and that acid plays an important role in breaking down food and also in absorbing the uh, minerals and micronutrients of our diet, but it can have this effect under certain conditions. And so what are those conditions? Well, I like to think about GERD as almost relying on several things going wrong. So the first is that there is something called a lower esophageal sphincter. And essentially this is a area that squeezes down at the end, the lower end of the esophagus before the esophagus connects with the stomach. I'll show you a diagram in a moment. Um, one of the things that allows us to kind of get into trouble here is if that, uh, that sphincter uh, 
is relaxed. If instead of being tight like this, it's open and allows the free flow of fluid in and out of that sphincter. Secondly, I like to think about what are the things that push the stomach contents back up the wrong direction. And increased abdominal pressure is one of those. This is uh, important not only for the general problem of obesity causing increased abdominal pressure, uh, but certain lifestyle choices can also increase this pressure, which again is sort of pushing on the stomach to increase the chance that the lower esophageal sphincter won't be adequate to keep the stomach contents from splashing upward. And then finally, the acidity of the stomach contents is a really important part of determining how irritating this process of splashing is. To the extent that the acidity of the stomach contents is lower, there's probably less damage being done. But this is a two-way street and lack of acidity can also cause some problems. And then finally, you know, one of the issues there is the volume of, of food contents in the stomach over the course of the day. And one of the main issues here is that quite often people are eating late, they have food in their stomach at the time that they are lying down to go to sleep. And that's a recipe for disaster if combined with any of these other problems that might be going on. So I'm going to kind of focus on some of these mechanisms as I talk both about the prevention and the non-drug treatment of GERD, as well as bring them back when it, we come to uh, thinking about medications and their role. So this is a, another diagram, you know, a little bit crude in terms of showing what's going on here, but you have this closed lower esophageal sphincter right here. And you can see that this is a way of resisting the process of the stomach contents splashing upward to this lower portion of the esophagus where we bear the brunt of GERD. GERD rarely occurs or rarely, rarely is as serious upwards in the esophagus as it is down in this lower section. So in this diagram over here, we see an open sphincter that's allowing some of the stomach contents to get pushed or to splash upward into the esophagus. Remember that the process of digestion involves the stomach contracting and relaxing contracting and relaxing as a way of mixing up the food with the enzymes and the acid in the stomach to make sure that food is partially digested before it continues on in the GI tract down into the small intestine here, this being the, the first portion or the duodenum of the small intestine. So what are the common symptoms of GERD? I think many of you are familiar with these. And uh, obviously the, the one that defines the condition most specifically is heartburn. This being kind of a burning sensation in the upper abdomen about here. And uh, especially occurring after a big meal or during the evening when the person is trying to sleep. But in addition to heartburn, GERD is also characterized by some problem swallowing and pain swallowing, and also by this idea of regurgitation. And sometimes the stomach contents really do get as far as the mouth or even in the mouth and then down into the lung potentially. So this is another area where people are having symptoms. Quite often, the symptom being an acidic taste in people's mouths when they wake up in the morning. Hoarseness from irritation of the vocal cords is another symptom. And again, all of these are really related to a large extent by how irritating hydrochloric acid is to our body. The stomach, interestingly, has a number of mechanisms that make it resistant. The stomach, almost unbelievably, can function well. The cells in the stomach are protected. 
against that acidity, uh, but the esophageal cells, the cells that are right above that sphincter, don't have that sort of protection. They don't have the resistance to be able to not be irritated, not be inflamed by the acidic stomach contents. Um, cough, similarly caused by irritation of the, the trachea going down into both lungs. And then chest pain is a, frequently a part of this. And uh, I, I very distinctly remember several patients whose chest pain was very severe. And so when we talk about heartburn, we're really talking about a whole spectrum that is going from mild uh, discomfort all the way to excruciating lower chest, upper abdominal pain. Also wheezing, nausea, and frequently insomnia are also part of the cluster of symptoms that tend to occur with GERD. Um, and then it's important to think just for a moment, and I'm not gonna spend a, a lot of time here, but there are many conditions that can mimic GERD and which often are mimicked by GERD. So the most important one here are heart conditions, particularly angina, when the heart is not getting enough oxygen through the coronary arteries, or a heart attack where those coronary arteries are actually closed down and, and clotted. Um, because of a problem in the heart. So quite often, there is an overlap between what people experience with these heart problems and the symptoms of GERD. And this makes it very important for GERD symptoms, especially those that seem more severe, to be fully, um, fully evaluated just to rule out a angina or a heart attack. Um, similarly, there are this similar kind of complexity around things that can cause the esophagus to spasm. Esophal, esophageal spasm is often located, the pain is located in the same place it would be for GERD. Um, peptic ulcer disease, actually a ulceration, a, a area where the stomach has gotten very irritated. Again, the symptoms are somewhat similar to those of GERD. The major difference, which isn't universal, is that quite often GERD is, is uh, elicited by eating food. That is, it follows after a meal is taken in versus peptic ulcer disease, where quite often people have some resolution or reduction in their symptoms with food in their stomach. Um, there's other forms of, of esophagitis that can also seem quite similar to GERD, and uh, hiatal hernia, where there's a, a little part of the stomach that can kind of sneak up next to the esophagus. Um, this is quite often associated with GERD itself, but has a presentation and has a treatment that may be somewhat different than GERD. So why prevent or treat GERD? Well, the obvious issue here is that people have quality of life reduction from the pain of GERD. This it can be really dis uh, disabling and debilitating for many people. So obviously we wanna treat GERD or prevent GERD just to improve people's quality of life if they can have fewer or no symptoms of GERD. But it's also important to remember that many of the non-drug strategies that we recommend for GERD may have benefits for other conditions. And some of this is as obvious as things like weight loss could potentially help things like high blood pressure or diabetes prevention, um, in addition to helping with GERD, um, a lower fat diet, um, taking care of ins insomnia. These are things that may illustrate a benefit of some of these non-drug strategies, both to GERD as well as other conditions. So in, in some sense, if we can use some of these strategies to treat GERD, we're also reducing risk from other conditions that may affect people eventually. And then a really important part of prevention and treatment 
is this idea to prevent serious complications of long-term progressive GERD. And these include Barrett's esophagitis, which in some sense is kind of a precancerous change in some cells within the lower esophagus, which if left untreated and continuing to progress because of irritation from GERD can develop into uh, cancer, an adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. So I'll talk about these a, a little bit later, but I think it's really important to note that we're, we're interested in treatment and prevention, not just because of the symptoms themselves, but kind of some of these secondary outcomes that we should be worried about. And I think this is a good illustration of how we often silo our approach to one disease or another um, and don't recognize the fact that weight loss or reduced alcohol, reduced fat in our diet, um, these may have other benefits beyond just one condition. So diagnosing GERD. The, the main thing here is that the diagnosis of GERD is usually based on a careful medical history that considers some of the other possible causes that I, I suggested. And in some ways, this is a, uh, a condition that's still being uh, diagnosed through, in some sense, the art of medicine. Um, yes, it can be useful to measure stomach acidity um, to see if how much that may be contributing or how much stomach acidity has been controlled by various strategies. Um, and then it may be also to have an endoscopic examination where a fiber optic tube is essentially snake down the esophagus um, to both look at the end of the esophagus, uh, but also to conduct a biopsy. Um, and this is particularly useful, especially if a person is at higher risk for these precancerous or malignant changes in the esophagus. But again, the hallmark of diagnosis is this idea is based on the history a patient presents with. And I haven't necessarily defy, defined all of the nuances of that. Uh, needless to say, there's a lot of variation and very rarely will a patient fit the, the textbook description of the clinical presentation. But there is a, a lot of art of medicine in terms of distinguishing this condition from others. So I want to go back to this issue of trying to prevent GERD in the first place. And I think this is an important goal that really has rarely been talked about. Um, I think we need to, to focus on these multiple um, types of mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. And if we're talking about this idea of trying to keep the lower esophageal sphincter intact, and not let it relax as much. The things that we can do to prevent that relaxation are to avoid smoking, reduce alcohol, reduce mint consumption, reduce chocolate consumption. And there are several medications, especially antispasm medications, which actually contribute to the relaxation of this, this sphincter between the esophagus going down and the stomach here. Similarly, um, there's a lot of things that do increase abdominal pressure. Again, that idea of punching the stomach in a way that causes this, its contents to be more likely to splash upward. Um, obesity is really the big one, and that deserves a, a few hours of conversation just on how we might go about presenting that. Um, but also think about these ideas of avoiding tight clothing, avoiding very big meals, and avoiding things like weightlifting soon after a meal. Uh, weightlifting obviously does contribute to a, a very large increase in abdominal pressure. That's usually not a problem unless our stomach is full. And then I also mentioned that idea of irritation of the esophageal lining. Um, a number of medications are very potent irritants, including non-steroidal medications like ibuprofen, Motrin, um, also some antibiotics, particularly doxycycline and the um, 
the erythromycin family like azithromycin. And here too, alcohol kind of plays a second role in being an irritant, as do carbonated beverages and other highly acidic food. Um, orange juice is kind of like the most obvious food that some people uh, tend to over enjoy. Um, but tomato sauce tends to be one of the very common parts of our diet that we often don't recognize as being as acidic as it can. And the idea here is that these various types of things are adding additional irritation onto the irritation that already is gonna be caused by the stomach acid itself. And then this idea of positioning is very important that gravity is really our friend in the sense that when we're standing, the stomach content, the ent contents of the stomach are kept down. And when we lie flat, we no longer have that benefit of gravity with the stomach being flat, the stomach contents are free to kind of move up or down as they wish. So lying down with a full stomach is definitely something to be avoided. Now, when it comes, to, oh, I, I did want to also just say here that I think we under-recognize the role that stress, mental health have in terms of creating and continuing GERD. Um, psychosocial stress can greatly worsen GERD symptoms. It's not so well proven that stress can actually initiate GERD, but among those people who are already having problems, it clearly worsens them. Worsens them. Um, similarly, both depression and anxiety create a situation where GERD is more likely to occur. Double the risk in depression and anxiety also virtually doubling the risk and doing so in sort of multiple complex ways. So not only does anxiety increase acid production, but it also seems to reduce the tone of the lower sphincter. Um, it also tends to increase abdominal muscle tension. That is, people who are anxious tend to actually have more abdominal pressure than those who aren't anxious. And then finally, kind of in a, a sense, uh, another type of effect is that anxiety really reduces people's ability to cope and successfully treat GERD symptoms. I want to make it clear that another complexity here is that this is a bi-directional relationship. G mental health and stress can cause GERD or cause GERD symptoms. And at the same time, GERD symptoms can actually cause stress and worsen mental health issues. And I think given this relationship and given the complexity of this, there's really an untapped role for mind-body approaches to GERD, which also, as I suggested earlier, may have other benefits in terms of other conditions, both prevention and treatment. So I talked about prevention as the things we can do to have somebody who does not have any GERD symptoms and keep them from developing GERD. Well, these very same items are really the same strategies would, we should use as a first line strategy for treatment of GERD once it occurs. So, you know, smaller meals and more chewing are gonna be very important. Uh, less fat in the meal. The reason for this is primarily that meals with a lot of fat are held in the stomach for a much longer time than meals that are high carbohydrates or high protein. Fats are more difficult for our system to digest. And part of that more difficult is that they need to spend more time in relation to the acidic environment of the stomach. Once the stomach contents enter the uh, duodenum, the small intestine, the pH, the acidity changes dramatically from being acidic to being more or less neutral or even slightly basic. So 
having less fat in our diet and in our meals will reduce the amount of time that food stays in the stomach. And if we can get rid of the food in our stomach, there's no longer any contents there or very little contents that can splash upward. Um, one strategy that's often recommended, which can be very uh, helpful, is to raise the head of the bed by about an inch and a half. And inch and a half just happens to be the, the width of a two by four. You know, the wood starts as two inches, but it shrinks down as it's drying to about one and a half inches. So raising the head of the bed by even that small amount creates a little bit of an incline that can have the stomach contents go downhill, just that little bit of, of amount, and stay away from the LES. Um, it's also recommended that sleeping on your left side is going to be more conducive to reducing that splashing than sleeping on the right side, just because of where the stomach is positioned in relationship to the uh, LES. And for people who are experiencing GERD, it's very important that there be a long delay between when the, a meal is, is taken in and lying down to go to sleep. Really about three hours is ideal. Um, the less fat in one's meal, probably one can get away with smaller times here, but we really want the, the contents of the stomach to have been passed on to the small intestine before we lose that advantage of gravity and go from standing up or sitting down to lying flat. Um, losing weight can be a really important part of treating GERD. And, you know, essentially this is probably has multiple mechanisms going on. One of them is that weight gain creates a, a pro-inflammatory environment within our, our body. And this is um, reflected in the irritability of the esophagus. The other mechanism, of course, is that with more belly fat, there is increased pressure in our abdomen. Again, pressure that's pushing on the stomach when it's full and increasing the likelihood that it will splash upward. And I think it is important to address stress and mental health as part of the treatment of GERD. And we often kind of skip this step, but this is important not only because it can have a big impact on GERD symptoms, but because it's also impacting other conditions or the risk factors for other conditions. So let's get into kind of the heart of what I was taught in medical school, which are these various classes of drugs that can be used to treat GERD. And as I'll, as I'll um, go on, I want to make the point again that in my mind, we should be treating GERD with the drug treatments as a last resort and as something that we can use for as brief a period of time as possible. Um, and as I suggested, some of the problems with these drugs are really in a way forcing us to prioritize non-drug treatments. And I think that's a, a very good thing in some sense. The main treatments for GERD are antacids, which are chemically reducing the acidity of the stomach, the histamine II receptor blockers, which are essentially blocking a trigger that if switched on, increases acid secretion in the stomach, and then proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs for short, which actually block the cellular production of acid more directly. Uh, there are a few other drugs and a few other strategies that I'll, uh, I'll mention along the way. But, you know, these three uh, treatment classes are very um, wide, and there's a lot of drugs in each of these. And in fact, if you look at the, the most, the best-selling drugs in the United States, at least proton pump inhibitors are right up there near the top. And these in the past, 
H2 receptor blockers and even antacids were very common simply because of the high prevalence of GERD in American society. And I should point out that if we look at international patterns, you know, Western Europe and the United States have some of the highest prevalence of GERD. But interestingly, much of the globe is kind of catching up to that, that developed country profile of high stress, high prevalence of GERD. So just about antacids briefly, um, you know, calcium carbonate is the most common um, form. These are things like Tums and Rolaids are mostly calcium, but there are other antacids as well. Um, these basically function to neutralize or in some sense buffer the stomach acid. So they have an effect of reducing the P, increasing the pH or reducing the acidity of the stomach contents. With that reduced acidity, the stomach contents are no longer quite as irritating on the esophagus, esophagus as they would be otherwise. Um, this is a quite old time treatment, but it's interesting that it can be quite successful uh, despite modest acid reduction. And part of the reason here, I think, is that often people who do use these antacids use a lot of them and they pick the times when they're using a lot of them. So it's, it's one of these, it's almost a self-management strategy to have a pocket full of Tums and when you need them, you need them. And uh, people will take, you know, five or six of them at a time. They are also, just I should mention here, there's another older class of, of drugs that's sometimes helpful because they increase the tendency of the stomach to empty. That is, the stomach almost empties into the small intestine prematurely. And these include a, a drug called metoclopramide as well as ondantrosone. So these are often used as an adjunct to some of the other medications I'm, uh, I'm discussing here. If we uh, talk about H2 receptor blockers, so this is a type of histamine receptor in the body to be distinguished from H1 uh, receptors, which are associated with allergies, for instance, in our sinuses um, or nasal passages. But H2 receptors are in the stomach and elsewhere in the body. And uh, they provide a way that the body signals the stomach cells uh, for the need for more hydrochloric acid. And uh, when these receptors are blocked, that triggering or communication from the outside through these receptors no longer occurs as much, and this reduces acid production. Um, some of the drugs uh, have these names that end in tadine, so cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, nitazidine. Um, these are, many of these are still out there. Famotidine tends to be the most widely used. And again, as I had uh, suggested before, these are available over the counter. So any consumer can go in and, and purchase these without a prescription. Um, these are moderately successful in relieving GERD, um, but they do have some side effects. They have some other GI side effects like constipation and diarrhea, headaches, uh, they're known for having lots of drug-drug interactions. Um, it so happens that the enzyme, the enzymes in the liver that metabolize these particular drugs also are involved in metabolizing a lot of other drugs. So this idea of putting these two drugs together can be really bad news. The other problem is that over time, people generally develop tolerance to the H2 receptor blockers. That is, it takes more and more of the drug to actually have the desired effect of moderate reduction in stomach acidity. And then there are some long-term problems as well, including osteoporosis, various types of cardiovascular disease, and also the, uh, the idea that some of these drugs have been 
subject to contamination over the years. And ranidine was essentially taken off the market when it was found that a compound called MDMA, which is a, a psychoactive drug, was actually contaminating the tablets that were mostly ranidity. So again, re H2 receptor blockers have been out there for a while. They are not as uh, effective as PPIs, but they're reasonably effective. They can be used long-term, but they do have some both short-term and long-term side effects that at least cause me to hesitate a little bit when I, uh, when I prescribe these. And then proton pump inhibitors are really the apex of the, uh, the food chain here when it comes to drugs for GERD. And the proton pump is a particular type of cell, cellular machinery within the cell wall that is there to increase the acidity of the stomach. It's this proton pump that actually gets kind of communicated with via the, the H2 blockers. So the H2 blocker is sort of one step removed from the proton pump itself. The PPIs actually directly interfere with that receptor, and this greatly reduces stomach acidity. And these are, as I said, more effective in terms of acid reduction versus H2 blockers. One problem here is the FDA has approved these drugs only for short-term use. Now, in my clinical practice, I have a lot of people taking these long-term. And, uh, you know, we didn't worry about that quite as much as we do over the last three to five years, uh, because uh, these drugs, including, you know, omiprazole and pantoprazole, uh, S-omiprazole, um, have some important side effects. And these downsides include some problems with, with dietary deficiency. When stomach acid is so drastically reduced by the proton pump inhibitor, it reduces our dietary absorption of some key um, minerals like iron, calcium, and zinc. It also interferes with the absorption of vitamin B12 and, and vitamin C. So in some sense, the benefit of the proton pump is that they do a really good job of reducing stomach acid. The downside, of course, is because they're so good at reducing acid in the stomach, it creates this second wave of problems. It's also known that the lack of acid in the stomach also impacts the type of bacteria that are growing in our gut, the so-called microbiome. If we look at the microbiome of someone on PPIs versus not on PPIs, we find that there are le there's less diversity. There are fewer types of bacteria in the gut than in a person not taking these types of medic medicine. And there's also seems to be a greater pathogen burden. That is, our, our gut is always going to contain some bacteria that can do harm if they get out of control. But the number of those pathogenic bacteria is greater in people taking proton pump inhibitors. And one of these pathogens that we really worry about, which the risk is doubled for in PPI uh, takers, is called uh, Clostridium difficile. And this can cause a, a very serious type of, um, of dysentery. Uh, kidney disease is another problem with the proton pump inhibitors. Um, these types of effects that I'm now describing really are those associated with long-term use. So you don't really get problems with, you know, dietary deficiency or the microbiome or kidney until you start taking these drugs long-term. And in addition, gastric cancer is increased because of a particular mechanism and a, another enzyme or signaling enzyme in our body, which is increased 
when we decrease the stomach acid. And then finally, risk of heart disease tends to be increased by about 20 to 30%. But heart disease is so prevalent that even this 20% increase is a huge number of people because right now we still have a huge number of people on PPIs. So one thing I wanted to say just in closing out the drugs is that you know, these drugs were really approved in a sense for, for, for short time use to be able to get the symptoms of GERD under control, reduce the irritation on the cells in the esophagus, allow those cells to heal. Once healed, they're a little bit more resistant to that splashing effect. That is, once GERD is present, it kind of begets itself. That is irritated, uh, ir the irritated lining in the lower esophagus is all that much more susceptible to irritation than is normal esophagus. And so there are some more drastic types of treatment that we can use. And these may be very important in severe cases and very important when some of the complications of long-term GERD are present. Uh, this is something called a Neeson fundoplication surgery. And it's basically taking part of the stomach, as you see in the middle here, and wrapping that part of the stomach around the lower esophagus. So we essentially have a ring of, a, of stomach that is encircling the esophagus. And as you can imagine, this kind of creates more tension, more pressure that creates a better sphincter here than would be without this surgical maneuver. Now, this surgery, even though it looks fairly complicated, and I suspect in some ways is, unless you're used to doing these procedures, but this can be done uh, laparoscopically by several different entry points in the abdomen without actually doing an open surgery where there needs to be a long wound in the abdomen. Uh, another type of surgery that can be done lapro laparoscopically is called a Lynx system. And I think this is really clever if you think about it. These are beads that are strung together. Each one of these is magnetic. So they are attracted to one another but they also have a little elastic band that's, that's threading them together. And so this, what this means is that under normal circumstances, these are close together, held in place by that magnetism and create a nice tight closure of the lower sphincter here. When food comes down the esophagus, coming from up here in the, in the uh, mouth, it passes through this lower sphincter stretches out the beads to allow enough room for the food to pass through, but then immediately tightens back up again. And uh, you know, I think this is a very clever type of uh, arrangement. It seems to work fairly well, <coughs> although there have been some complications to this. And I, I don't want to give the impression that this is a routine type of procedure. This is really res uh, a last resort for people who are having very bad symptoms or are facing some of the complications that occur with GERD if it's allowed to occur long-term. And I do want to just mention these complications because, again, these are one of the reasons we're so serious about preventing and treating GERD. So the first is called Barrett's esophagus. And this really has to do with precancerous changes or dysplasia of the lining of the esophagus from prolonged inflammation. So you basically can think about irritation of the lower esophagus being in stages. You know, first it gets a little bit irritated, then it gets more frankly irritated and then inflamed. Eventually, this gets to the point of Barrett's esophagus, where there's been enough inflammation that the cells start to respond to this, um, this inflammation by changing and becoming precancerous. And this 
strangely enough, can actually occur in the absence of GERD symptoms. So this is why, as a primary care doctor, I'm particularly eager to make sure that I'm not missing somebody who might have GERD without necessarily having the full-blown heartburn symptoms. I look more for things like difficulty swallowing, kind of a, a problem with swallowing food, and then three seconds later, it coming back up or it passing with difficulty into the stomach. Um, people who have Barrett's need to be followed by periodic endoscopy and biopsy. And they also are the ones who we should use intensive acid reduction strategies in, with, even if that means keeping them on long-term PPIs. And they are the ones who are the, the best candidates for surgery. And then if left unchecked, uh, Barrett's can develop into esophageal adenocarcinoma. So this is a true malignancy where those cells in the lining of the esophagus at the lower end of the esophagus change so much that they become unregulated as the case is with you know, all adenocarcinomas. Um, this is a really bad cancer to have. The, uh, it has poor five-year survival, uh, less than 50%. And with certain other things going on, like it escaping the, the, the local uh, environment of the lower esophagus, the five-year survival is even a, a lot less. So very worth thinking about all the upstream stages that occur before we get to the point of esophageal adenocarcinoma. So I just wanted to summarize here by kind of coming back to this big picture and hoping that you can see GERD as both an interesting condition with some real um, conundrums in terms of treatment, uh, but also an example of how we tend to treat chronic disease, particularly this idea of reaching for the drug cabinet before other non-drug strategies. And uh, I really feel like non-drug treatments and self-management should be emphasized some of the worry about these drugs has catapulted us back into taking this, these uh, strategies seriously, um, but we even need to be more intensive about them. Um, one of the things is that many of these non-drug strategies can also not only prevent GERD, but other conditions. We need, as if we needed another reason to reduce alcohol intake, you know, alcohol not only adds to the irritation in the esophagus, it makes for the uh, stomach contents to be more irritating, and it loosens up the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Um, mental health contributes incredibly to this condition. And while that's kind of very widely uh, acknowledged by physicians, we don't actually take this into account or more intensively try to deal with those mental health issues um, compared to how we should. So I think this really means that we should have, have more intensive approaches to mental health, particularly anxiety and depression. And one part of this could be mind-body therapies. Again, things like you know mindfulness, things like relaxation, yoga, meditation. And then uh, finally, just want to thank you for being here. And I have some questions that have been posed before we started today. Um, but I also see that there are a number that are in the Q&A. So at that, I will take a pause and just see, make sure that I'm stopping my sharing, which I have, and uh, welcome you to continue putting in the um, the questions as I start to go back and look through the ones that I already have. So you know, one question here is also um, is the issue of motility. Motility essentially refers to the process by which the food digests and moves through the gut. 
And there are a number of things that can lower motility. Um, I spoke for quite a while about fatty meals, reducing motility. But some diseases, particularly diabetes, can also reduce the motility of the entire, um, entire gut, essentially by having killed off some of the critical nerves that supply the stomach with innervation and which give the stomach signals to let the food pass out of it and move on to the small intestine. So the uh, motility is a, a problem and is quite often the reason why a drug like metoclopramide is used to try to um, facilitate emptying the stomach earlier than the, uh, this would be in, the, uh, in, the, in a usual circumstance. Uh, there's also a uh, question about mint. Um, you know, not on a usual consumption level, but at an overload level, mint clearly is bad for GERD, uh, mostly through the mechanism of relaxing the lower esophageal sphincter. Again, that, that connection between the esophagus and the stomach, which keeps the stomach contents where they belong in the stomach and doesn't let them splash upward into the lower esophagus. Um, let's see. Um, a, a, a Schatzky ring is a particular malformation um, near the esophageal junction. Um, that's kind of beyond what I, I want to talk about today, but, you know, there is, uh, there is more monitoring that's um, important there. Um, a, more, uh, a more relevant uh, question for the, the general person here is coffee. So this is a little tricky. So coffee is quite acidic. And for people who have ongoing uh, symptoms of GERD, you know, I recommend against coffee. And it doesn't matter if it's decaf or caffeinated coffee. It's really largely the um, as acid in the stomach, the acid in the coffee that's contributing to the uh, irritation that the stomach contents can have. Um, and yes, PPIs are generally not recommended in chronic kidney disease. You know, basically once one is, has developed any type of impairment in the kidneys, it's important to really reduce the risk of other compounds that we ingest or that we take as, as medications, which could represent other uh, toxic exposures to the to the kidneys. Um, so, how do you have this issue of long term exposure to PPIs? So, again, this is a really interesting issue, and I I didn't really go into it in full detail earlier. But you know, we have these drugs that are quite effective at reducing acid production for many people, not for all. But for many people, they're effective at greatly reducing GERD symptoms, and yet they are approved only for short-term use, which, as I read the, the FDA's labeling, means several to many weeks, so certainly not several to many years. Um, this makes it really important for people to try to discontinue PPIs. And there's been new attention on this idea of discontinuation, you know, because of some of the potential harms of the PPIs. In the past, our usual practice was just to tell the person to suddenly stop the PPIs and see how they did. You know, I can tell you that that was my strategy for many years. And unfortunately, I have to say, you know, maybe it worked about 25% of the time. You know, one out of every four patients would come back to me saying, hey, I did great without the PPIs. 
Now I don't have to worry about them, at least not for now. The other 75 said, you know, there's no way I can live with this recurrent pain in my belly from the, the heartburn. I've, I've just restarted these medications, whether you want me to or not. Um, and that was, again, the, the, frequent, uh, the frequent experience with trying to discontinue. These days, I try to do two things. One is to have people focus on learning all of these non-drug um, strategies ahead of stopping the PPI. I then taper the dose of the PPI at the same time as starting a uh, H2 blocker, a histamine 2 receptor blocker. Um, like famotidine, for instance. I find that this is one way to successfully get a larger fraction of patients off the PPIs. Now, not everybody. And, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work the first time, I may try just more slowly going through that same process, always emphasizing the intensity at which people need to really deploy those non-drug strategies. And um, I've been very successful, you know, certainly about two thirds of patients, if they follow those recommendations are able to get off the PPI medications. But there are an awful lot of people who have been out there on PPIs for a long time who just simply aren't able to do that. One of the things that happens on PPIs is that the number of acid secreting cells in the stomach actually expands. There's an attempt of our body to kind of compensate for the fact that each cell no longer can produce as much acid. So there's more cells that are producing acid. And you can guess the outcome if we suddenly go from this amped up stomach that's amped up because it's been exposed to the PPI. We take away the PPI suddenly we're in a worse situation than we would be normally because there's more acid producing cells now that aren't being down-regulated by the PPIs. Um, let me see if I can get one more question. I apologize that I cut this kind of short um, and I do wanna try to just look at a couple of questions. I'm gonna jump back to my pre-questions. Um, You know, again, we really should be trying hard to get um, get people off of the PPIs. And, um, you know, we're, we've been partway successful at doing that. But I think this is kind of got a lot of press when some of these studies came out three to five years ago. Um, but it's no longer quite as topical. I think this really needs to be... Uh, be to be done better than it is. Um, I think there are a lot of questions about these different medications. You know, that's interesting that this is the focus of, of most of the questions. And to me, really just reinforces my impression that we haven't done enough to really promulgate these non-drug strategies. Um, and uh, we ought to think twice about doing that. And we ought to really give people more coaching, um, not necessarily from a doctor, but even using dietitians, for instance, to do some coaching on what foods, how to change their diet, and how to implement some of these other lifestyle behavior changes that can be very helpful in preventing and in treating GERD. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm sorry to, sorry to sh cut short the questions. I really have appreciated all the questions I've seen. I can see that they're still coming in at this very moment. And I, I really apologize for not getting to all of those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Strafford, for sharing this great information. And thanks to our audience uh, for joining us and for the great questions. If you would like additional information or resources, please contact the Stanford Health Library. We hope you will join us for our next lecture.